Cool, great. Um, so, hey, I'm Jelle. Um, actually, I'm a designer. Um, what am I doing here? Um, when I was being asked to talk at this conference, I said immediately yes, and I was like, oh, this is cool, closure. Um, and then I realized, wow, if this would have been a year ago, I wouldn't have done this. I wouldn't feel as confident um, as I am now with programming. Um, and that's mainly thanks to Closure Script. And actually, so this talk will be targeted towards feeling confident with Closure Script. Actually, the subtitle of this talk will be The Things I Dare to Build Thanks to Closure Script. So I'll show a lot of cool stuff. I'm a designer, so I need to show stuff. Like, that's your expectation, right? Um, so I'll start with GUIs. Um, I'm a designer, I like to make them simple, minimalistic, but that doesn't always turn out to be as simple to execute, and because I'm the one who's actually executing it, um, often, my own crazy ideas, um, I feel like, wow, actually, sometimes I'm, I'm taking a step back from my ideas and like limit them a bit because they're too complicated to build. And I find this very, uh, very frustrating because the ideas are cool and I need to limit them because of the technical aspects. Um, so, um, this. Can somebody write a parser for this? Um, and just being able, oh, it's very blurry on the screen. Um, being able to just um, do UI simply and make make simple stuff, like which is designed simple, also be able to execute it simply. So what is so hard about graphical user interfaces? Um, so I took I took a year off to research why and. Um, to um, to find something which will help me um, building my own GUIs in a more clever way. So, well, the first thing I stumbled upon was state. Everybody was talking about state, and state is the horror. Um, and um, for you, for those who don't know what state is, um, state is the data which runs on the hood of your application, and actually you're trying to um, make your views represent what is actually happening under the hood. So your GUI is like a representation of the state that was in the first talk today mentioned. Uh, I found that very suiting. Um, but so people are not able to understand the raw state. And so we need to put something behind this state, which will make it fancy. And um, then the user clicks a button somewhere, and the state changes. If you have something else going on elsewhere, um, then that's also mutating the state. And then you have like all of a sudden chaos. Um, so we kind of need to figure, like, f find a way around this. Um, okay, so let me give you an example of of a project. I I I totally messed up because there was too much stuff going on. Um, it's called SoulSeek.js. I I think two years, two and a half years ago, uh, at the hackathon, I teamed up with a friend. Uh, and we tried to make SoulSeek in the web browser. We wanted to play around with WebRTC. Um, and uh, it became a bit like this. Can I play it? Yay. So after six hours, we got it working. It's built on Angular. And um, um, like the WebRTC part was the easiest part. Uh, so this friend of mine made the design. He like did the styling whatsoever. Um, and did like the, the front end, I hooked it up with the WebRTC, we had a chat going on, um, and you were be able to look at each other's files and send them over. Um, so actually after six hours we got it working, the rest was all fine tuning of the user interface. Um, so the, it, it 
some of you remember the original SoulSeek, it had multi-chat rooms. Um, so when I started, um, like after the hackathon, I was like, oh, I'm going to add multi-chat room. So you're actually able to join the jazz chat room or w uh, whatsoever chat room. And um, that turned out to be harder than expected w for something which I thought like, hey, it's just I'm adding a chat room, I'm switching chat rooms, and I'm, uh, I'm removing them. So uh, how do I proceed now? Ah, there we go. So this is a bit how Angular uh, tries to structure your code. This is kind of, this is the best practice, what they say. So you see all the arrows like going back and forth, like um, that's, that's where all the problematic stuff starts to happen. And um, that's why the whole thing didn't work out. So, um, wouldn't it be great if we could just write it way simpler, having a state, rendering it, and then manipulating the state? Um, so um, I mentioned I took a year off, and I s uh, stumbled early that year. I already did a bit of React, but actually it didn't really solve my problems of um, like the view layer was more interesting and more simple, and it kind of um, took me out of the whole framework paradigm. But I found it really hard to work with state itself still. So, um, and then Ohm came out. That was December 2013, I believe. Um, and I put it to the test. Um, so, um, I locked myself up in my house. Um, I bought some closure books, uh, read them all, and then I started using Ohm. Um, and I built SoulSeek CLJS. Um, let me, maybe I have a, yeah, have a demo running. Let's see, it looks like this. Uh, probably the screen resolution kind of fucks it up, sorry. Um, so yeah, we have like all the chat rooms, being able to join a couple of chat rooms. It's currently mocked. Um, so you're being able to browse, flick through the chat rooms. Um, then you see the music libraries. Oh, it falls off the screen a bit. Um, so this was easy peasy. Um, all of a sudden, I felt like, whoa, actually, now it becomes predictable what I built. Uh, the code is all online, by the way, so you can play around with it yourself. Uh, it, it Unfortunately, doesn't had, uh, have the um, uh, WebRTC baked in. I didn't have time enough to finish that. Um, okay, so I stumbled upon something which I really liked. It was simple and um, it didn't cost me as much headaches as AngularJS or React on its own. Actually, and ClojureScript felt really powerful in a way to be able to like for the chat rooms to be just like okay I have a list with chat rooms and just take five of them and being able to do stuff like that that would take a lot of lines of code and a lot of complexity uh, in JavaScript but there's more um, and actually so I already mentioned I want to talk about the free goodies you get uh, with closure scripts. Um, so some of them um, were already mentioned slightly here, um, but I'm, I'm trying to go a bit more in depth. Um, so the first one, I'll just, um, there we have Chestnut and Tenzing. Um, yeah, let me just show a video. Uh, so this video is by David Nolan and he's, um, um, he hooked up a chestnut, which comes up with a browser apple um, in with this terminal, um, so he could actually see the app state um, of what's running, and then he can um, actually manipulate the app state while the app is running. Uh, it's not being reloaded or something, it's just uh, hot swapped, uh, actually executed uh, directly. Um, also, you can just change the change the 
the running code. So uh, this is like part of the view function. Uh, he's adding a new paragraph, and it just appears there. It's not being reloaded. It's actually just hot swapped in. And then he creates another list. Uh, okay, buffering. Well, I hope you get the points. Um, so, and then there's something small I made. Um, I wanted to, um, so there's this thing called Quill, and Quill um, is this layer on top of processing. Processing is Java, so you can tap into it with Clojure, um, and it allows you to do live coding with processing all of a sudden, which you weren't able to do with processing on its own. Processing on its own. Um, and since processing got ported towards uh, JavaScript as well to the web browser, and Quill followed, I was like, okay, great. So now we can bring live coding to the web browser. Uh, I had a couple of friends we're, who were not that tech savvy with, uh, with the terminal, but I wanted to uh, learn them closure. Um, so it was just a matter of like, um, let me show it to you. Um, that one. So I made like a small, um, small editor, uh, which allows you with like comments enter uh, to execute code and change uh, what you see with, um, with Quill. Okay. That's online. It's not 100% working. I didn't figure out how to, um, um, how to get around the dependencies which are. Uh, hard coded in the closure script and closure script compiler. If somebody can fix it, that would be great. It's too, too deep for me. Um, okay, so the video we've already seen. Okay, so the next cool thing, uh, which actually that was the initial trigger to get me into um, to closure script. Uh, that was the to do MVC, uh, which uh, David Nolan published after introducing um, closure of like uh, Ohm. Um, and uh, let me just show it to you. Um, it allows you to, um, yes, on the screen. It allows you to, um, just the standard to do MVC, add to do's, um, delete them, um, clear. It allows you to do uh, undo's, redo's in a web browser. And this is just um, like 13 lines of code, uh, which, is, which totally blew my mind. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even know how to do this in JavaScript. Um, um, that's, that's out of my league. So just being able to do this in 13 lines of code in Clojure blew my mind. Um, and then there's uh, Goya by Jack. Um, let's see, can we, okay, screen problems. Can you see it? Yeah. Um, it allows you to draw um, and see the history of what you drew um, on the right hand side. Actually, it, it's a visual representation of your history. Um, uh, that's just crazy. Uh, and this is, this is about 60 lines of code, uh, and mostly it's for implementing the whole graphical user interface for this history. Um, but just being able to do this in 60 lines of code is crazy. Um, back to the slides. Um. Okay, so th this is actually the code. We can run through it, but... Um, maybe not. Um, anyway, you can look it up. It's on David Nolan's blog. Uh, he wrote a whole article about uh, being able to time travel. Um, then we have introspection. And I, I really find this amazing um, to be able to see what's happening under the hood, so what's happening with the state, and actually being able to visualize state. 
Um, we're going to switch again. Okay, this is totally sc screwed up. Okay, um, I'll explain it a bit then. Um, what this is, is a visual explanation on how to build a Tetris game in ClojureScript um, with Ohm, I believe. Um, and it's actually really done well. It explains you all the functions which are happening and it shows like the state um, and how it's being updated. So you can see the blocks moving um, and being updated. Um, and I think this is this is amazing. Okay, and then we have dev cards, which kind of gives you um, a tool for this. Um, um, Bruce, um, who made Fig Wheel, which is like the the hot swapping parts in Chestnuts, for example. Um, he um, he came up with dev cards to be able to kind of make a similar approach to like the whole Tetris thing, but also use it in development. So being able to isolate parts of your applications um, and um, give them a visual representation and start fiddling around with something small uh, and make them immediately visible um, and have it have it as small as possible. So then you can like iterate, have like add another function, see if it still works in various stages. Um, this is a huge help. I used it for two of my projects and um, I really like using it. Okay. Um, and then the last one. Um, which is portable state, and that's that's more recent thing. Um, I'll show you something I which I made like two months ago at a hackathon. Um, so this is a web audio patcher. It allows you to add a couple of nodes. So we add a oscillator node, and let's add a filter. Um, so we can say add a filter, and then we'll add something else. Uh, let's put it a bit like this. So if I add another screen, um, so we have the same patcher again. Um, I was I I was thinking like, wow, okay. So I made like a cool small synthesizer in my web audio patcher, but now I want to share it with my friends. How am I going to do this? Okay, I can build like a really complex backend for this, um, but that felt a bit too much for just one function. Uh, just being able to share it with your friends, that you don't need a whole backend for that. Um, so I thought, okay, I have I now have these global app states, uh, like I, this all runs from one global app state, and maybe I'm just able to pick it up and drop it in another window. So I made like a clever um, reusable component, which allows me, so now I'm doing um, command C, I'm copy and pasting it. Hello. Oh, sorry. I. Was I can now copy and paste it in the other web browser. Um, and since it's just a global app state, uh, I, I, it just re-renders it for me. It activates all the web audio things. All of a sudden, it becomes so much easier. Um, the amount of code for this um, is just 17 lines of code. Uh, you can just drop this in in your own application right now, and it will work. Um, it's just the input field. Uh, you can see it here. This is just being rendered as an input field. I hide it. Um, if you press Command or Control, um, I focus on that input field. I serialize the state, and I put it um, in that input field. So if you press on C afterwards, so this is happening really fast. If you press on C, I, um, well, you, you obviously uh, copy what's in this input field, which happened to be the serialized state. The other way around, pasting it, 
is um, you press control, and um, since we're pressing V, you paste the value into this text field. Then I wait, let's see, what was it? Um, oh, actually, I took it out. Well, y yeah, 30 seconds. I, I, need to, I need to wait 30 milliseconds um, before I can read it. Um, and then I just replace the whole app state with what's being read. Actually, it looks like this. I'm using transit for this. Um, so this is actually my patch, and I can share this over the internet uh, with somebody if I want. Um, um, so actually, this is being used in production somewhere as well. It's Circle CI. Uh, let me. And let's see. I have. Do I have sound? Hi, I'm Daniel from Circle CI. I'm going to do a quick demo to show you. Haha, <laughs> buffer. Great. I thought it was being buffered already. Okay, don't use the internet for split seconds. Possible now that we've taken React State Service and mounted it into Ohm's global app state. So on the left here, I have Chrome. I'm on the Add Projects page. I'm going to type something in this input to filter repos. And now this input is stored as component local state, so it's transient. OK. Well, um, what is being done is um, he does the same trick, serializing the state. Um, and then, uh, so they use it for help desk manners. They can just ask people to do a specific key combination. Um, and then it pops up like a screen in the application, which they're able to copy paste and give to the developers team and say, uh, this is wrong. Th like, there's some edge cases we meet in our layouts here which don't work. Um, please fix this. Um, th I think this is amazing. This is um, so you can now do it um, just by copy pasting my reusable component, um, and then you can use it in your own project if you're using Ohm. This is Ohm, um, and actually, that's uh, how do I? Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is the, uh, this is the clipboard component. Um, so these were these are things I wouldn't do myself in JavaScript. I d I don't know how. I'm I'm, I'm just a hacker. Um, but so but there's other advantages which makes me feel confident with using. Um, Closure scripts. At first, when I when I entered um, the closure script realms, I was like, "Oh, this whole compiler step in between—that's such a hurdle." But um, actually, I love the compiler now. Um, I found a way how to um, how to trigger notifications every time it compiles, and I can directly see whether it fails or succeeds. Um, and that kind of saved me a trip to the browser and see whether my code works or not. Well, I need to test whether the behavior is good, but I'm sure the, the code will run. Um, also, I, I really, I started to appreciate Lisp. Um, I, um, I never did a Lisp before, so um, it, it's been amazing so far. Um, and then there's core async, which um, takes all the spaghetti which comes with callback, uh, like callback hell, um, which you need to use a lot in user interfaces because there's a lot of asynchronous stuff going on. Um, so corded async, uh, it was kind of hard for me to understand in the beginning, but that's because you're thinking too hard, actually, because it's a super simple concept. Um, maybe it's maybe it's it's just asynchronous. Asynchronicity, well, uh, which is hard, um, and which makes uh, corded async also instantly hard. Um, and I'm now looking into using core typed uh, also for user interfaces. I have the feeling that's going to be beneficial as well. Although actually, I want to type less um, instead of more. Um, actually, I'm I'm really on time. Cool. Um, so I've been using a lot of Ohm, um, and 
the later stage, I was using Chestnut a lot. Um, but I, like a month of three ago, I switched to Reagent, um, simply because it feels more closure script to me. Um, it's, um, it makes cursors optional. Um, it makes, um, it doesn't, when I need to introduce people to ClojureScript, I feel that Reagent is way simpler because you don't need to learn React. F for Ohm, you need to, um, actually you need to learn all the lifecycle components of Ohm and you need to, uh, sorry, of React, and then you need to be able to uh, conform to the syntax of Ohm, which comes with like records and whatsoever. So. Reagent is a way simpler approach to this. Um, I haven't stumbled into things I can't do with Reagent, uh, which I can do with Ohm yet. Um, so f for me, that's a big plus, being able to learn it to other people really quickly. Um, with that, I recently switched to Tenzing, which Martin this morning introduced. Um, so that's, that's using boot instead of landing in. Um, which, for me, um, I don't know, like having an immutable um, like build system feels better than having like a mutable build, st build system um, and not having to boot up a couple of JVMs to have Vic Wheel and the browser REPL running. Uh, that's also a big plus. So um, I'm often coding while traveling and my battery dr dr just drains if I have a couple of JVMs running. So uh, that's a big plus. Uh, and it's actually, th the rest is just the same as Chestnut. So I didn't have to learn that much new. So my conclusion of this talk is that if you want to have less head headaches, go close your script. Um, um, it, for me, it really simplifies the way I'm making UIs, uh, way less code to maintain. Uh, but also um, way less stuff going on in between modules or whatsoever. Um, did I forget something? No. Questions? Pretty sure. There's one. We have still 50 minutes to fill, so. First of all, thanks for the interesting talk. Um, my question is, are you satisfied with the current state of uh, source maps? Do you find uh, debugging in the browser? Um, is, is, it, is it usable right now? Um, so, yeah, source maps, actually, I think Two months ago, there was this huge update in ClojureScript, uh, which enhanced the source maps even better, um, being able to, I don't know what exactly anymore, but yeah, it's getting better and better. Um, it was quite frustrating in the beginning when I started learning, but I took it for granted because actually the compiler kind of um, took a lot of the initial pain away. Uh, and especially when I had this notification uh, thing baked in, that was that was all of a sudden uh, really nice. Does that answer your question? Great. Uh, you mentioned uh, working with some other designers and helping them kind of get a bit comfortable using closure scripts and things. How did they take to using well Emacs or Vim or tools like that uh, when they were working with Closure Script? Was were they just able to use their own tools, or did you end up having to kind of get them using those ones as well? Well, so since I'm like in most of the projects, I'm the designer myself. Um, I think Lighttable is a really good introduction. So if they're not capable, uh, and there's like for every big. Um, um, every big 
like Sublime has also REPL tools for it, but actually you don't want to make them mess around with that. Um, um, I think it's, um, for designers, if you're working with designers, it's way better to have actually to make sure you have hiccup in your application. So that's like having this nice um, um, square bracket uh, HTML syntax. I think that's way more important uh, than the editor. If they can just use that, um, yeah, I don't think editor is a big thing. Hi, so really nice presentation. And I wonder whether you uh, published this code for notification on GitHub? So you mentioned that you have something like that. So it's baked in with, um, with Tenzing, actually. It okay. actually, it speaks it out. It, like the first time it started speaking to me, I was like, oh shit, um, <laughs> um, is this, uh, is there some somebody in my computer? Um, and so there's like a speak notification. Uh, you can do it uh, with Liningen by adding, um, you can add a post script to the compiler, and I just use Grohl notifications mm -hmm. for that. So just a command line uh, thing. And the second question, uh, what do you think about uh, having a template file, like, like a partial, like a part of the HTML file on the server side, and then sending it back to uh, OM or whatever React implementation. Are you so talking about like isomorphic apps or actually sending something? So I'm just uh, other thinking about having a full HTML file uh, send it upwards, so to the uh, client, and then update only part of it using OM, for example only replace, for example, one div that was per-generated on the server side. Um, do I understand you correctly that you want to server-side render HTML. things and then just take that HTML and use... Use, use on client and then update it on client. So ah, okay, then start, so isomorphic, uh, like the isomorphic approach. Um, um, there's there's a template out there. I don't know the name exactly, um, but there's a template now which allows you to do isomorphic OM apps. Um, I don't know the name, unfortunately. Yeah, it's uh, I th I didn't look at the code. I guess it's really hard to do. Thanks for a really good talk. I was wondering if um, earlier we heard from Michael about Reacle. Maybe the two of you guys could have a short debate about the architecture of the front end now. Because mm -hmm. it sounds like you were recommending a reagent. Yeah. And then Michael was addressing even similar like general problems with the So he, um, uh, Michael mentioned in his talk he didn't like Hiccup. Uh, I really love Hiccup. It makes it way more readable for me. Um, so that's why I would prefer a reagent at first. Plus, I, I kind of, I like working with the global state and um, not having abstractions around the muta like mutating this, because I felt this was in Reacol. I didn't play around with it. Uh, it's, it's really a thing you should try out. Um, um, and yeah, I, I need to poke around with it first before I can judge it. Yeah. But yeah, I really would like to have a chat with him afterwards. If nothing else, then uh, we wrap it up and see you in like 20 minutes or so for the final round of lightning talks and then for a nice evening. So thank you once again. Thank you.